Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, great to be with you this morning. Uh, we missed you guys last week because we were uh, actually uh, on vacation. We went to Utah, uh, and I saw some of the most beautiful scenery uh, that I have ever seen in my life. It literally took my breath away. We went to, this is a picture of uh, Zion National Park. Uh, then we also went and we saw uh, Snow Canyon. And everywhere we went, it was just so incredibly beautiful it blew my mind and I had this thought I'm like wait a second like is this beautiful because it's actually beautiful or is this beautiful because I just drove through Nevada and after driving through Nevada anything seems beautiful uh, it's kind of like when you're on like a diet you know and uh, you're on a diet and then like you eat something you normally don't like like a cherry tomato and you're like oh my goodness this is the best cherry tomato I've ever had in my life how have I not discovered that I love cherry tomatoes this much and then later on you have one when you're not really hungry and you're kind of like huh I don't really like cherry tomatoes why did that taste so good earlier and I guess the saying is true that that hunger is the best seasoning and I think that is true for landscapes as well uh, because we went and saw all of these different landscapes and I feel like God really uh, really went all out he he landscapes the Grand Canyon. He goes into Utah and landscapes the Zion and Bryce and Snow Canyon and Moab. And then he kind of takes like the Sabbath rest in Nevada. And then he kind of picks it back up again when he gets to Lake Tahoe. Then he rolls up his sleeves and gets back to work. It's kind of what it is uh, like. But it's, it's so beautiful. Um, when I was in some of these places like Zion or Snow Canyon, you're looking around and it's so, it takes your breath away, uh, not just because of the high elevation, <laughs> but it takes your breath away because you're looking and you're thinking to yourself, man, God imagined this and then he speaks it into existence immediately, speaks it into existence and all of a sudden there's, there's canyons and there's rivers and there's red rocks and, and green vegetation and these amazing skies and you're taking it all in and I'm thinking this and it completely I am I'm left speechless because how incredible and beautiful it is and and I hope that you've had that experience as well maybe it's not looking at a national park maybe uh, it's seeing your kid for the first time or or maybe you hear this song and it just really hits you how great God is or maybe it's the moment uh, of your salvation and you feel your sin being lifted off and being nailed to the cross and it's this moment where you stop and think and you, you, you it goes when you know you, you have this thought when I think of all of this I fall to my knees and and pray to the father the, the creator and of everything in heaven and on earth and and you might be thinking Ken, that's a, a very specifically worded thought uh, that you're saying. Uh, actually, Ken, that kind of sounds like a Bible verse. And that is correct because that is the first verse in our passage this morning, Ephesians 3.14. We've actually been talking about it for a few weeks, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I was talking about how Paul started to have the thought in verse 1. He says, when I think of all of this and, and what Paul was thinking of is what brought him to his knees was that he's like, I cannot believe that the Gentiles and the Jews who were enemies for thousands of years are together now in the same family, worshiping the same God, experiencing the same salvation. If you've ever had like a family argument or a family feud and finally when the two people come together and, and there's peace in the house it is like a Christmas miracle well this is that fighting's been going on for thousands of years and so Paul falls to his knees he can't believe that we're all part of the same family that feeling you felt uh, when you saw God do something amazing the feeling I felt when I saw the beauty of God's creation Paul is feeling the same thing and he goes on a rabbit trail a couple weeks ago and then he picks it back up in verse 14. He says, when I think of this, I fall to my knees and, and I pray because God is so good. When Paul falls to his knees, his body is, is reflecting what's already happening in his heart. Paul is not saying that, that we need to 
you know, get on our knees and, and fold our hands. And there, there's not like a position with our bodies to maximize the effect of prayer. It's not like you have to be in alignment and then suddenly your prayer travels 40% faster to get to God, you know? And I say that jokingly, you know, there's not like prayer yoga, there's not a prayer chiropractor to get you in alignment. At least I hope not. I'm going to Google that, and if there is, I'm going to be very disappointed. But, like, I say that, though, because when I was a kid, I thought the position mattered. I thought you had to be on your knees. I thought you had to have your hands like this, like the emoji, <laughs> and, and you had to bow uh, your head and pray. And, and every night I would pray uh, the Lord's Prayer as a kid, only... Uh, I didn't know that, um, I didn't know the word art was a thing. And so when I was praying for months and months, I was praying, our Father who aren't in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I'm praying this for months, and then I, someone hears me, and they're like, wait, are you saying our Father who aren't in heaven? I'm like, yeah, it's a prayer. He's like, no, it's art, meaning is, not aren't as in isn't. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> who have I been praying to this whole time? <laughs> and then I got scared because I'm like, well, if I'm not praying to the Father in heaven, I'm praying for the Father who isn't in heaven. Have I been praying to Satan? And I was so scared as a kid. I mean, talk about getting the mailing address wrong or texting the wrong number. And I'm like, what have I invited the devil into my life? And I was super scared. But then I'm like, no, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Like, I think God knows my heart. So, you know, I'm sure God ran the prayer through Grammarly, cleaned it up a little bit, and then he understood what I was actually trying to, to, to say to him. And, and that's kind of what Doug was talking about last week. Uh, Doug went over these verses as well, and Doug was saying, listen, the, the, the posture of our heart matters to God right? The posture of our heart towards God matters to God the most. And that is very important because prayer is so, 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 so important to you and I. Uh, Warren Wearsby, he's one of my favorite authors of all time. Uh, he said, it's through prayer that we lay hold of God's riches that enable us to behave like Christians and battle like Christians. Whether we actually bow our knees is not the important thing, that we bow our hearts and wills to the Lord and ask him for what we need is the vital matter. And it's true. It's key. Uh, in in 1711, there was a man named John Short, who I'm sure was probably very tall with a name like Short, because that's how it works. In 1711, John Short invented this very simple thing that changed the way you and I hear and, and interact with music forever. It changed how the whole world hears and interacts with music. In 1711, he invented this very simple instrument called a tuning Fork. He invented this tuning fork, changed everything about music because before the tuning fork, everyone would tune their instruments with pitch pipes, wooden pitch pipes. But the problem is, is if it's humid or if the temperature is too high or too low, it affects the wood and then it changes the pitch of the, of the pipe. So everyone's using these wooden pitch pipes, tuning their instruments, but all the pitches aren't exactly the same. So when everyone's tuning their instrument, the instruments are not actually in tune. They're not in harmony. And so he invented a metal tuning fork so when you hit it, it produces a pure frequency at 440 hertz. It's the middle A on the, on the piano. And it doesn't matter what the temperature is. It doesn't matter how humid it is. It's always the same frequency. And so musicians started using tuning forks. So suddenly, orchestras sound more in tune. And it's a universal frequency. You can go anywhere in the world, and instruments are tuned to a tuning fork. And that's how we get and hear music the same no matter where we go. The notes sound the same. And the crazy thing 
about tuning forks is you can put two tuning forks together and you can strike one tuning fork and then the frequency will hit the other tuning fork and the other tuning fork will start vibrating to the exact same frequency. Uh, it's something that's called sympathetic resonance. And, and I'm telling you all of this because I believe with all of my heart that, that prayer is a tuning fork to align our will with God. That's what prayer does. It's a sympathetic resonance where we are aligning our will to the frequency God has. We harmonize our heart with, with God's heart. If, if you think about the Lord's Prayer, it's, you know, our Father who art in heaven. You know, our Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and in heaven. And, and give us our, our daily bread and, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. Uh, yours is the power. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory now and forever. When we pray those things, we're not telling God what to do. We are declaring that we want God to do the very things he promises to do in his word already. We are saying, God, I want you to do the things you've promised to do in my life. I want to align my heart with what you are saying and what you are doing. I want to align my heart. I want to be on the same frequency as you. So prayer is a tuning fork that, that resonates with our heart so that we become closer to God and align our lives with God. And as, as we do that, Paul is praying for very specific things to happen in your and my life in our passage. He, he does this prayer it's kind of like a spyglass or a telescope, you know, where you open it up and there's different sections and you look through a telescope and as you look through each section, the thing on the other end that you're looking at becomes clearer. And in this passage, it's a telescoping prayer and there's four things that Paul is praying for that as we see through these four things, as we experience these four things, there's a clear picture of who God created you and created me to be, of who God called you and is calling me to, to live. And Paul's prayer, his telescoping prayer, he prays for four things. He prays that we will be spirit-filled, that we will be Christ-centered, that we will be deeply loved, and that we will be fully alive. He prays for those four things. And as we go through them, I want to ask you a question that I will ask you again at the end, and the question is this. I firmly believe with all of my heart that God is going to give each person in this room and every person watching online an invitation to take a step forward to become closer to God, to take a step closer to become the person God created you to be, to live the life that God created you to live. He's going to ask you. He's going to invite you. This sermon is not condemnation. This sermon is an invitation. This message is prayer is an invitation. God is going to put on your heart, I firmly believe, a step that you can take this week to become closer to God in these four areas. And Paul starts his prayer off saying that he wants us first to be spirit-filled, to be spirit-filled. He goes on and his, he starts his prayer in verse 16. He says, I, 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 he's fallen to his knees and he says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. So Paul is praying for you, he's praying for I, he's praying for Ephesians, that God would give from his glorious unlimited inheritance, or, or your Bible might say that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened. 
Paul isn't asking God to conjure up something or create something to give to us. Paul isn't saying, hey, would you please give us a little portion of, of what you got? Paul is saying, I, I don't want you to give a portion of what you have to us, God. I want you to give in proportion to your glorious unlimited resources. And there's a difference. If, if if I was Jeff Bezos, I would be incredibly wealthy, fantastically wealthy, and if you came up to me and said, hey, Jeff, can I have some money, and I give you 20 bucks, uh, I'm giving you a portion of my wealth, a very, very, very tiny, tiny portion. If you come up to me and say, hey, Jeff, will you please give me some money, and I give you $200 million, now I'm not giving you a portion. I'm giving in proportion to what I have. It matches my wealth. I'm giving you something that matches what I have available to give you. And so Paul is saying, don't give a portion. I pray that you will give in proportion to your, your unlimited resources and specifically I want you to fill us with the Holy Spirit. I want you to strengthen the inner man by the Spirit. And Paul prays this because without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we have nothing. We have nothing. The Holy Spirit is that important to you and I. The Holy Spirit is so important that when Jesus was with the disciples at the end of his life, he tells them, it's better if I leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. He says in John 5, 16, 5 through 7, he says, hey, I'm, I'm going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate, the Holy Spirit won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And at first glance, if you're a disciple, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. In what world is it better for Jesus to go away? You've been with us three and a half years. You perform miracles. You've explained the word of God. You've raised people from the dead. In what world is it better for you to leave so that someone else could come? What could possibly be better than having you right here with us physically? The Holy Spirit, Jesus understood, was that important because because. Without the Spirit, we don't understand God's Word. Without the Spirit, we can't change. Without the, the Spirit, we can't really do anything in and of our own strength compared to what we can do with the Spirit. When Jesus died, he, he rose again, and he reveals himself to the disciples, and he explains the scripture to me. He explains the Old Testament to them. These guys are, are ready to preach the gospel. They've been trained for three and a half years by Jesus. They understand the scripture. They've been going out already and preaching the good news of the kingdom. They have everything they need to go out and be successful, but Jesus says, do not go until you receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, 4, 5, and 8, he says, He, Jesus, gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. A while ago, uh, I had a computer break at church, and, and if you've never seen the inside of a computer, that means you probably had a social life in high school and maybe even went to prom. This is what the inside of a computer looks like. I know what a computer looks like, so I can tell you that that statement I just said is absolutely true. Uh, this is the inside of a computer. It's kind of a mess. Uh, I, the motherboard broke on the computer, so I had to unplug all of the wires, take the motherboard out, put a new motherboard in, plug everything back in, 
I go to push the button, nothing happens. I'm very frustrated. I check the wires and I'm like, oh my goodness, I just spent all these hours and all this money on a bad motherboard. I'm very frustrated. So I pull all the wires out, unscrew all the screws, take the motherboard, throw it away in the trash. And then I'm like, this is so frustrating. I just go sit in my office and I just go work on something else. I'm so mad, you know, when something should work and it doesn't, I don't know why, I just get really, really angry. And so about an hour later, I'm like, wait a second. I don't think there's this one tiny four pin thing you got to plug right into the motherboard and you're like, yeah, there's no way he wins a prom. <laughs> there's, <laughs> uh, there's one tiny thing you got to plug in. And so I'm like, I don't think I plugged that in. So I go get the motherboard out of the trash. I'm like, please don't be broken. Please don't be broken because I threw it in there pretty hard. Put, take everything, put it all back together, plug it in. This time I plug in the one wire which, power, which goes from the power supply unit to the motherboard plug it in, turn it on, boom, the computer's up and running. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm an idiot. I'm telling you all of this because without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are just a bunch of hardware wired together and we cannot do anything without a power source. The Holy Spirit is our power source. Without the Spirit, we can't do anything. And so Paul earnestly prays for the church, the first thing he prays is that we would be people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he even emphasizes later in Ephesians 5.18, he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the starting point in a believer's journey because it means we can understand the scripture. We can, we can begin to change because God changes us. We need to be spirit-filled. And Paul says, when you are spirit-filled, then you can become Christ-centered. You can become Christ-centered. He goes on in his prayer and he says, listen, that, or he continues to pray, he says, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your, your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. So as we are spirit-filled, Christ comes into our home and it, it says that he makes his home in your hearts. That makes his home, um, that is uh, the Greek word that it means, it means to dwell in. It means to dwell in. It's the Greek word kato kesai, and it means to an ongoing residency, a permanent residency. So the, the gospel the gospel is not invite Jesus into your hotel to then check out the next night and you go on and do whatever you're going to do. It's not saying a prayer, checking a box, Jesus comes to stay for a night, then he moves on and you go back to living how you want to live. The gospel is accepting Jesus into your heart as a home, as, as a permanent residence. And, and as he is in the, the permanent residence, we become Christ-centered. We start pursuing things that Christ would pursue and we start doing things that Christ would do. That's, that's the gospel. Um, what, one of the hardest things in ministry is, is doing funeral. We, we, we open up hassle to whoever needs, wants to do a memorial service in the community. We want to come alongside families that are hurting. It's a privilege and a, and a joy to be able to minister to families in those ways. But then the hardest part is um, when you do a, a service for someone and they're like, oh yeah, when they were uh, 60 years ago, when they were five years old, they, they accepted Jesus as their savior. Uh, and, and so they're in heaven now. And then I listen to their eulogy and I hear their whole story and, and there's nothing in their life that tells me at least that they made, that they did anything that was, was Christ-centered. And, and so I'm not the final judge. I'm not standing up in heaven saying who goes to heaven and, and who doesn't. But I do know that, that saying you're a Christian is not the same as actually being a Christian. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. 
the gospel isn't checking a box. Our heart is not meant to be a hotel that Jesus checks in, checks out, then we go on with our life. Our, the gospel is accepting Jesus as our Savior and making our heart his home where he permanently abides and, and we become Christ-centered. And when we do that, Paul says that our roots go down and that we're made strong, or, or maybe your Bible might say being rooted and grounded in love. Uh, Paul is using dual metaphors. He's saying that when we're Christ-centered, uh, we're like a tree is one metaphor. And he says our roots go down into God's love for nourishment. And then the other thing, grounded in love, it's a building term. It's, it's a Greek word, themaleo, and it means to lay a strong foundation and when you have a strong foundation, you'll have a strong life. And, and Paul uses the same exact word that Jesus uses. And in that passage where, where Jesus says, Lord, Lord, in that passage immediately afterwards, he tells the story of, of builders. In Matthew 7, 24, he says, listen, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rains come in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built, themaleo, a strong foundation on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds his house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. I, uh, I was reading this book about a pastor. He's kind of just telling his life story. And, and his church got big enough where they had to build a new church, a bigger building. And so they found this piece of property and they started uh, testing it. And, and where they wanted to build this new building, it was actually on an ancient lake bed. And so they had to do all these soil tests and they had to spend forever on the foundation and put all these rocks down before they could even lay the foundation. And, and all this money is, is going out the door and deadly lines are coming and going and people in the church are kind of like why are we still giving we're not seeing anything happen and it's way more expensive and it's it's taking way longer and all this stuff happens and finally the pastor gets so frustrated he he goes to the architect and he's like listen all this money's going out the door and I'm not seeing any walls going up why is this so expensive why is this taking so long and he said the architect said something that the pastor remembered for the rest of his life he said the architect said pastor or the most important part of this building is the foundation. If you don't go deep, then you can't go high. God is inviting every single person in this room to live a Christ-centered life. Uh, not to be morbid, but if we were all gathered here uh, for your funeral or for my funeral, if we were to hear the eulogy, if we were to hear the life story, would we hear a story that says, yeah, this person lived a life that was Christ-centered or, or not? And, and the good news is, the good news is, is I guarantee every single person in this room, every single person watching online, I am 100% convinced that you all and I am still alive. So that means that we are still writing the story. So we can write whatever we are going to write. We can live in a way so when we, that day does come, people will look at our life and be like, yeah, yeah, this person lived a Christ centered life. Their heart was not a hotel that Jesus is like, yeah, you can come check in on Sunday mornings, but you need to be out of here by Monday. It's a one night stay. Uh, their heart was a home that was Christ centered. Because Paul says, listen, if, if, if you're spirit filled, if, if you are Christ centered, then you will understand that you are deeply loved, that you are deeply loved. Paul goes on in the prayer, he says, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Paul, he, he throws out all of these measurements, how deep, how wide, how high, how, how long, because he's listening. Listen, there's no possible way 
you and I could ever measure how much God truly loves us. It is immeasurable in every direction. It is, it is all-encompassing. And, and I pray that you would understand as you're spirit-filled, as you're Christ-centered, your roots go down into this love and you, you understand how much and how deeply God desperately loves you. I'm not great with like measurements and, and, and the best, one of the best word pictures that the, the guy tried to explain the passage this way. He said, you know, how, how wide is God's love? God's love is so wide that, it, that is, it extends to every person who's ever lived. It says, for God so loved the world, God loved every person that whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but, but have eternal life. So God's love is so wide, it goes to every person who has ever lived, who is living now, and, and who will ever live. And how long is it? You know, to what length does God's love go? And he says, God, God will go to the length that he will send his son to the cross because he loves you. That's the length God would go to show how much he loves you. And how high, how deep, uh, how deep is, is that God would send Jesus to die on the cross, to go to the depth of the grave so that you will never have to experience your punishment for sin. You will never have to experience separation from God. He will go to that depth of the grave because he loves you and how high is that Jesus is in heaven. Like I know every single person in here, every person watching online, every person that was here at first service, we all have things in our life that are challenging right now. Like I, if I, I said, think of the top three things that are a challenge to you right now. You're like only three. Um, in Hebrews, it says that Jesus is, is how, how high is his love? That he's in heaven right now. And he's praying for each one of you individually. Whatever those three things are, Jesus is praying for them for every single one of us because he loves us. He is praying to God on your behalf right now. And, and he's prepared a place in heaven that is waiting for you. It has your name on the mailbox. It's your name on the door. He loves you. That's how much, that's how wide his love is. That's how long his love is. That's how deep his love is. And that's how high his love is for you. He loves you with this love that is unmeasurable. And not only is it unmeasurable, it's unbreakable. In, in Romans Eight, Paul's thinking about this, this, this love and he's so excited. He says, overwhelming victory is ours in Christ Jesus who, who loved us. And I'm, I'm convinced that, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, uh, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above and in the earth below, indeed nothing in all of creation will ever, ever be able to, to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves you with a love that is immeasurable. It is unbreakable. It is unconditional. And it is unchanging. God loves each and every one of you so so much. And Paul prays. He's like, God, please, I want every believer to be spirit-filled, to be Christ-centered, so that they can know beyond a shadow of a doubt and experience how much you truly are loved by God. Because when you experience that love, Paul says, you become fully alive. He says, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, all glory to God who, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. 
glory to him in the church and, and in Christ Jesus through, through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul is saying, man, if you're, if you're spirit-filled, if you're, if you're Christ-centered, you know you're deeply loved and so you're fully alive. And, and my hope is, you know, when you came through the door this morning, before you even had a cup of coffee, did you come through the door thinking, man, I'm, I'm spirit-filled. I am I'm Christ-centered. I, I, I know I'm deeply loved and I am fully alive and ready to worship. And if you felt that way, praise God. That is awesome. And, and if you came through the door and you didn't feel that way, I'm not asking, well, what's wrong with you? I'm saying that if you came through the door not feeling that way, then I'm telling you this, that God is giving you an invitation to take a step closer to him, to take a step closer to Jesus so that you can become that. Because I'm convinced that, that God is calling you, that God created you to be someone who is spirit-filled, Christ-centered, deeply loved, and fully alive. That's the life God created you and I to live. And that's the life that Paul was praying we would experience. And so if you're not feeling that this morning, maybe think through where you're at on the telescope and, and, and uh, God, what is my next step? God, m maybe God is saying, you need to pray for more of the Holy Spirit in your life. Or, or maybe God is saying, you need to be more Christ-centered. You need to do a renovation in your heart where your heart is not a hotel, it is a home. And if you are at home, you have permission to go into every room. If you don't, then you're a guest, right? When you go into your house, you go into whatever room you want to. But if we are letting Jesus into our home, but we're only saying you can only go into this room and this room, but you can't go into these other five rooms, that, then he's a guest. You're, you're running a bed and breakfast, okay? Uh, Jesus we make our heart a home where we say, Jesus, come in and go into every area of my life. Maybe your next step is to let Jesus into an area that you have been keeping him from and let him into that room. Uh, or maybe you need to just understand how much God truly loves you because you'll, if you've traded that if you're finding your identity in something in the world, if you're finding your value and your love from something in the world, you're settling for a cheap imitation. You'll never find something on this earth that's going to love you with a love that is, that is uh, immeasurable, that is unbreakable, that is unconditional, and is unchanging. So find your value, find your worth in how much God loves you. Or, or maybe... Maybe you need to stop seeing yourself as you see you. You need to st stop seeing your problems as you see them, and you need to start seeing yourself as God sees you. You need to start seeing your problems as God sees them because the verse says it is his. It's, it's not yours. It's, it's not mine. It is his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Christianity is, it's not about you trying to change you to make yourself acceptable to God. Christianity is not about trying to solve your problems on your own and then coming to God and say, God, am I good enough? Christianity is saying, I believe in the power of God to do the impossible in my life and I'm going to open my art I'm going to open my arms. And I'm going to say, God, I want you to do what you're going to do in my life because I trust you. I want to be spirit-filled. I want to be Christ-centered. I want to be deeply loved and experience that. And I want to be fully alive. So I trust you because with us, almost everything is impossible. We look at so many things and we think this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus says in Luke 18, 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. We hit something and we think that's impossible. And God says, impossible is actually where I start doing things. 
And so see yourself as God sees you. See your problems as God sees them and let his power work to change you. Let his power work through the problems that you are having and trust him to do what he is going to do because God created you. God is calling you to be spirit-filled, Christ-centered, deeply loved, and, and fully alive. In Acts chapter 4, uh, after Jesus went back up into heaven, the disciples received the Holy Spirit, and, and they heal this guy, and it causes a big commotion. And so the disciples get called into the council that f about 50, 60 days earlier had uh, condemned Jesus to die and crucified him. So now Peter and John are before this very same council, these very same wicked men, and they're saying, how did you heal this guy? Who gave you the authority to heal this guy? What is this message that you are preaching? And just peppering him, peppering him, peppering him with questions. And Peter and John are just sitting there, and they're, they're answering with confidence. They're answering with confidence. And the council can't figure out why these people are so confident. And it says in Acts 4.13, the members of the council, they were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Sometimes we approach the Bible and we think, man, Peter sure is awesome. Wow, John sure is amazing. Wow, David is, is so great. Matt, wow, Moses did all this amazing stuff. I could totally see why God chose these people. That's the wrong way to look at it. God didn't choose these people because they were awesome. God chose these people because they were ordinary, but they opened themselves up to say, God, use me. Peter and John, they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. And so the council cannot figure out how do these guys have confidence? How did they heal this guy? What is going on? The only thing the council could figure out was this because that's not the whole verse. The whole verse actually says this. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's the difference. I know and believe that God is calling every single person in this room to take a next step to move closer to Jesus. I know he is doing that, and he's doing that for me. I was this morning, God, what is my next step? And, and God's like, you need to be more intentional about your prayer life. And it's not a condemnation thing, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to get closer to God. And so I'm going to work. I want to be more intentional with my prayer life because I want to get as close to Jesus as possible because I believe and I hope you believe that God is calling you. God created you to live a life where you're spirit-filled, you're Christ-centered, you're deeply loved, and you are fully alive. And so step into whatever God is calling you to do because that's what he's calling you for. That's what he created you to, to, to be. That's the life he wants you to, to live. And the crazy thing in all of this is this whole series is called Spiritual Misfits. The reality is like, like no offense, but like we're all ordinary people, right? We're all ordinary people. We are all spiritual misfits. But here's the beauty is what brought, brought Paul to his knees is that as a family of God, as we take that step together, we will become the church that God created us to be. We will become the church that God is calling us to be, that I want Hessel to be a church where people come to it and they say, man, that church is, is spirit-filled. Man, that church is Christ-centered. Man, that church, I feel deeply loved. And, and man, that church feels fully alive. But that can only happen if together we take whatever step God is calling you to take because the invitation is to live the life God created you to live of spirit-filled Christ-centered, deeply loved, and that you will become fully alive in Christ. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you so much 
for your word. I thank you so much for this prayer. And God, I pray that you would impress upon the heart of every person here, not condemnation, but an invitation to take that next step to say, God, I, I, I believe you created me to be fully alive, to be deeply loved, to be Christ-centered, to be spirit-filled. And so God, wherever we're at in our journey, whether we are one of those things or all of those things, you love us the same. Wherever we're at in our journey, you love us the same. But when we get closer to you, we experience that love in a greater and more meaningful way. So God, I pray we would desire to get as close to you as possible so that we can experience the love, knowing that Paul said we can't fully understand it until we get to heaven. But God, I pray that this would be, today would be the starting day where we move closer to you and experience your love in a new and deeper way because we want to live the life that you created us to live. We want to live the life that you're calling us to live. And I pray every person here would know wherever they're at in their journey that you love them deeply. And we ask all of this in Jesus' most holy name. And I thank you, God, that now we have an opportunity to, to worship you, that we have an opportunity to praise you because you are truly worthy of all of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you, God. Amen. Thank you for watching Hessel Online. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend. If you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.